three minutes from now. We're just waiting for all of the attendees to join. So please be patient. We will start in about three minutes. I'd like to welcome all of our YouTube live stream viewers uh, who are now live as well. We are going to get going with the launch in about two minutes. So if you could please uh, just bear with us, we'll get going on the hour in about two minutes. Good day, everybody, and a very warm welcome to everybody joining this virtual media conference from whichever part of the world you may be connecting. We're especially pleased to welcome so many members of the global media, but also, of course, our non-media viewers joining us on the YouTube live stream as well. Uh, just to mention, for those of you who are social media users, you can post about this launch uh, on social media using the hashtag, hashtag biodiversity climate science. So today we're going to be launching the landmark IPIS IPCC co-sponsored workshop report on biodiversity and climate change. My name is Rob Spall and I lead communications uh, for IPIS, the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Before we begin, I'd like please to confirm for you that the media embargo has been lifted you will find the media release, the workshop report, and the scientific outcome all on our website at www.ipbes.net forward slash biodiversity climate science. That's all one word with no spaces, biodiversity climate science. So I'd like to start today by sharing with you a quote from our friend and colleague, the late professor Bob Skoltz, who once said, and I quote, as biodiversity conservationists, we've been talking to ourselves for far too long. As a result, the loss of nature has been seen as a problem that's far away, being dealt with by other people. But to win the battle, to make the world a sustainable place, the main place we have to work is in the lived landscape where ordinary people exist. That means it's everyone's responsibility and everyone has a role in ensuring we have a sustainable future, end quote. The report we're launching today is the result of a four-day virtual workshop that was held in December, but also five months of intense work that has followed since then, a global collaboration between not only 50 of the world's leading experts on biodiversity and climate change and our 25 expert peer reviewers, but also between IPBES and the IPCC which is the first time our two intergovernmental platforms have collaborated on science policy at this level. 
Our program today is quite straightforward. We'll begin with a few remarks from Dr. Anne Laragadri, the Executive Secretary of IPBIS. We'll then hear a short presentation uh, about the main messages of the report from Professor Hans Otto Portner, the co-chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of the workshop and also co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC. Following Hans's presentation, there'll be a brief video response from Sveinung Rottervarten, the Norwegian Minister for Climate and Environment, and then we will open up the floor for media questions. Uh, joining Peter, um, sorry, joining uh, Hans and Anne on our panel uh, today for questions are most of the section leads from the report. I'm just going through that list pretty quickly. Dr. Mahesh Sankaran, uh, Professor Wolfgang Kiesling, Dr. David Abura, Professor Almut Arnef, Professor Paul Ledley, Dr. Yun Shin, Professor Guy Midgley, Professor Sarah Diamond, Professor Pamela McElvey, Professor Shunsuku Managi, and we're also joined uh, by one of the non-section leads, uh, Professor Unai Pasquale as well on the call. So I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize all of the workshop participants who are not on the panel today. And with that, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Anne Laragadri, the Executive Secretary of IPPUS, to make a few opening remarks. Anne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob, and greetings to all uh, media representatives around the world. Before we begin, uh, I wanted to take a minute to recall that our report has been dedicated to uh, the memory of our good colleague, and friend, Professor Bob Scholes from South Africa. Bob was together with Hans Otto Pertner, the co-chair of this uh, workshop. He co-led the production of the report and he uh, very sadly passed away just a few weeks ago. He himself uh, contributed in a very significant manner to both uh, IBES and IPCC and uh, as reflected uh, in his words that Rob just uh, shared, uh, with us, he really truly embodied uh, this spirit of collaboration between our two uh, organizations. He's of course with us uh, today in our thoughts as we launched uh, this uh, report to which he really so strongly uh, contributed. So a few words about IBES and IPCC. As you will recall, uh, both IBES and IPCC are intergovernmental science policy processes. Their members are uh, governments and their mission is to strengthen the science policy uh, interface in particular through uh, the production of scientific assessment uh, reports, focusing on one hand on biodiversity and nature's, con nature's contribution to people uh, when it comes to uh, IBES and focusing on climate taken in a very broad sense uh, when it comes to uh, IPCC. So the overall context uh, for uh, the workshop. Well, first of all, we're all aware uh, that the world is experiencing a number of environmental crises, two of the most prominent ones uh, being uh, the loss of biodiversity and nature's contribution to people and climate change. The report explains why there is an urgency to address both of these uh, topics uh, together as of now. And there is also an important uh, international context, of course, with this year two uh, important meetings taking place, the COP or Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15 on one hand, and the COP26 of the Climate Change Convention on the other hand, both uh, in principle taking place this year, this year and both expected to uh, address these issues. So finally, a little bit about the process itself concerning the workshop. So uh, originally the IBES plenary, which uh, took place a couple of years ago, IBES 7 in Paris, uh, asked the IBES uh, secretariat to explore with uh, the IPCC secretariat possible joint activities regarding the interactions between biodiversity and climate change to be carried out together uh, by the two bodies. And it was decided to start uh, this collaboration with what in our jargon we called a co-sponsored uh, workshop. 
So 50 experts uh, were selected, half from IBES, half from IPCC, people who had been uh, involved before in the production of their uh, respective uh, assessment uh, report. Uh, they are from all regions of the world. They met virtually uh, in December 2020. The meeting was originally planned uh, in London, in the UK. The workshop was virtually hosted uh, by the UK with support from Norway. The report was subject to several internal reviews as well as an external peer review. And as you have seen, two documents are being uh, released a short workshop report with a synopsis which contains the key messages from the workshop, as well as a longer scientific outcome which provides the scientific basis for these key messages, including seven sections, about 1,500 scientific references and a glossary. One important point uh, is that this is a report from the workshop. It is not an assessment and a key difference here is that this workshop report has not been endorsed or approved by uh, governments. This report from, forms a contribution to uh, a new assessment, which uh, the IBES 8 plenary starting Monday uh, is expected to initiate on the interactions between biodiversity, food, water and health in the context of climate change. We refer to it as the nexus assessment, and it is also expected to uh, feed into the uh, IPCC 6 uh, assessment report and synthesis uh, reports. So with this uh, opening background information, I thank you for your attention and I hand back over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Anne. I can see we're starting to receive uh, some questions already from our media colleagues. Um, so let me take a moment, please, to explain how the question session is going to work. Um, first, because this is a media launch, we will focus on questions from the media specifically. Uh, to our media colleagues, please post your questions in the Q&A box only. Please do not post your questions in the chat box. And please do start your question by indicating which media organization you're with. And do please feel free to start posting questions already. We will get to these a little later in the program. Uh, I'm very pleased now to invite Professor Hans Otto Pertner, the co-chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of the workshop, and also co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC, uh, to share with us some of the main messages from the workshop report. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob, and I hope you can all hear me. And hello to everyone, a, well, a very warm welcome also from my side. My name is Hans Pertner, I'm co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2, and I've been co-chair together with Bob Scholes of this IPBES and IPCC co-sponsored workshop and its report. It is my pleasure to provide a short overview of our key findings. This report deals with three intertwined systems, the changing climate system, the changing biosphere where we currently see accelerating loss of biodiversity and the human society, which is going through its own inherent crises such as the current pandemics and associated challenges. Climate change and biodiversity loss are threatening human well-being as well as society. They are closely interconnected and share common drivers through human activities. They are reinforcing each other and are intertwined through mechanistic links and feedbacks. Nature currently absorbs more than 50% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions already through carbon storage in biomass and organic material, as well as through CO2 dissolution in ocean water. Relevant parts of this service are provided by the underpinning biodiversity, but biodiversity is at risk from ecosystem degradation resulting from human activities including human-induced climate change. Ecosystem degradation 
in fact enhances greenhouse gas emissions and therefore climate change. Now, what is already happening? We are seeing multiple impacts of climate change on all continents and in all ocean regions. These increasingly add to the enormous human pressure on biodiversity, which is causing its progressive loss. So far, conservation efforts have not been sufficient to stop these developments. The surface area currently subjected to ambitious conservation is simply too small to stem the loss of biodiversity on a global scale. Human society depends on the services that nature provides, but climate changes cause loss in natural resources, especially those that are overused, for example, through overfishing. It also causes losses through excessive droughts and it causes mortalities in heat waves and in excessive wildfires, not only among animals and plants, but also in the human population. Climate change and biodiversity loss are two of the most pressing issues of the Anthropocene. Depending on the degree of climate change, we are expecting dramatic climate-induced changes in terrestrial and marine ecosystems. The schematic on the top right of this slide indicates that impacts are related to the specialization of all species on limited temperature ranges, as indicated by their thermal performance curve. It reflects the ability of species to grow and last not least, to store carbon. This curve is dynamic as it responds to additional drivers, such as acidification and hypoxia in the ocean. This curve also shapes the biogeography of species. Many species virtually everywhere are on the move because they stay in their preferred temperature range. Drastic changes are projected at the low latitudes, as indicated on the left-hand side, by the widening of the grayish belt as we move in global warming from two to four degrees Celsius means, and the associated drop in species riches there. This concerns mostly the higher complex organisms, such as animals and plants, which have lower levels of heat tolerance than most other organisms. An immediate conclusion is that maintaining biodiversity and its functioning relies on phasing out emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. Nature's contribution to people also include carbon binding and storage by the forests of the planet, thereby helping climate mitigation. As the capacity of plants to bind CO2 also depends on temperature, the reddish color on these two globes indicates, and the top one is the one for current climate, that even then the optimum temperature for this process is surpassed during certain months of the year. This trend is then exacerbated with further warming as we see in the bottom left. The plant productivity curve that I've just added to the slide, it covers productivity across latitudes. It will continue, productivity will continue to go down and the affected surface area where vegetation cannot keep up such performance will increase. At the same time, degradation processes such as of permafrost will release CO2 and methane and contribute to emissions. Again, ambitious emissions reductions are a precondition to stop these trends and to enable the biosphere to help mitigate climate change. Plant life is in fact already in use to help mitigation, but actions taken to mitigate climate change can have either beneficial or harmful effects on biodiversity, depending on policy. Ignoring the inseparable nature of climate, biodiversity, and human quality of life will result in non-optimal solutions to either crisis. For example, 
on the left you see that planting by energy crops in monocultures and if this occurs on large shares of land is often damaging to biodiversity and may even compromise human food security. Conversely, on the right hand side, restoring natural ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrass meadows, forests, peatlands, grasslands and savannas enhances carbon storage and benefits biodiversity and people. Biodiversity assists people and ecosystems to adapt to climate change. Actions that halt, slow or reverse biodiversity loss can also help mitigate climate change. To support intact and fully functional habitats under climate change and halt biodiversity loss, on average 30 to 50% of the world's ocean and land should be subject to effective conservation. It should be emphasized that ideal areas likely vary spatially among biomes and with local contexts, but are substantially larger than at present. Previous policies have largely tackled the problems of climate change and biodiversity loss independently. However, treating climate, biodiversity and human society as coupled systems is key to successful outcomes. Effective conservation and climate actions would go, in hand, go, would go hand in hand across landscapes in cities as well as in rural areas. If these actions also take people's needs into account, benefits and outcomes for climate and biodiversity protections as well as humans can be maximized. A network and a mosaic of protected areas results as indicated here on this slide, where species can migrate with climate change and populations remain connected. This approach considers all ecosystem types and also connects protected spaces and those where human uses are possible. Nature is offering solutions which can be effective if paralleled by strong reductions of emissions in all sectors of human society. However, these actions can influence each other mostly positively as indicated by the blue lines, but sometimes also negatively as indicated by the orange lines. This applies to climate actions as well as to actions for biodiversity conservation. The density of orange lines is higher for actions narrowly focused on climate actions, indicating a higher risk of trade-offs. Many of the solutions are still in the ideation phase or have not yet been deployed at any sizable scale. The lesson from this analysis is that pathways for sustainable development exist that can successfully navigate through the multiple crises we face. As time is getting short to reach sustainability for all systems concerned, the transformative change relies on rapid and far-reaching actions of a type never before attempted. When treating climate, biodiversity and human society as coupled systems, the benefits and outcomes for climate stabilization, biodiversity conservation, as well as humans can be maximized in terms of resilience and risk reduction. Pathways and their implementation rely on effective transformative governance as shown on the right, enabling capacity building, cooperation across sectors, inclusive decision-making and strong environmental law and policy. To summarize, we are learning from this and from earlier reports that it is urgent. Successful implementation depends on rapid entry into action. This includes ambitious emissions reductions from fossil fuels, restoring a resilient biosphere and biodiversity, addressing justice and equality, eradicating poverty, and overall, Every bit of warming matters, every lost species and degraded ecosystem matters. <laughs>
And with that, I wish to thank you for your attention and also thanking Bob, who has been with us for most of the time when we prepared this report. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much, Hans, uh, for the presentation and for sharing those messages with us. Um, and again, our sincere thanks to you and to all of the participants in the workshop for your tremendous efforts that led to the production of this workshop report. And we'll now hear a short reaction to the launch of this workshop report by Sveinung Rottevarten, the Norwegian Minister for Climate and the Environment. Uh, you may recall that the governments of Norway and the UK were the co-hosts of this workshop. I am very pleased to join you all at the launch of this important and much anticipated report. The world is dealing with multiple crises, the climate crisis, unprecedented biodiversity loss, and of course, COVID-19. Strong and urgent action is needed to address these interconnected crises. I want to thank the scientists from IPBS and IPCC for your tremendous effort. Experts from IPCC and IPBS have on numerous occasions contributed as authors to assessment reports from both panels. But from what I understand, this report is the first joint report. We sincerely welcome this cooperation and this important work. I also want to thank the UK for co-sponsoring the workshop last December and commend you for all your efforts in preparing an ambitious COP26 in November. I appreciate your leadership in the Global Ocean Alliance which Norway is a part of. As individual countries and members of a global community, we need to have a deeper and better understanding of the links between biodiversity and climate change, based on credible and relevant knowledge. This report will strengthen our ability to predict the consequences of our actions, to consider the best ways forward, and to understand the effects of possible trade-offs. The Biodiversity COP in Kunming and the Climate COP in Glasgow represent unique opportunities to drive cohesive actions that benefit both climate and nature. We stand ready to contribute to effective and ambitious outcomes from both COPs. Stopping the loss and degradation of ecosystems rich in carbon and species both on land and in the ocean is identified in the report as a priority action. Tropical forests are essential in the battle against climate change and to preserve global biodiversity. Without our forests, we risk undermining our food and water supply. There is, in short, no sustainable future without protecting and preserving tropical forests. This is why the recently launched LEAF Coalition is a massive step forward both for our climate and our biodiversity. The LEAF Coalition ensures that ambitious tropical forest countries that reduce their deforestation rates get access to financing. That we need more intact and effectively protected areas is another priority from the report. Therefore, 2021 will be an important year, both battling some of the most pressing global environmental issues of our time and reaching new agreements. The world needs all countries to step up their ambitions, saving both climate and the environment. As this report makes very clear, solutions helping both the climate and nature will be in high demand. And it is my hope that this report will serve as an inspiration. Again, thank you very much for all your hard work and for the report and thank you very much for listening. I'd like to uh, thank um, Minister Sveinung Rottavarten, the Norwegian Minister for Climate and Environment for his message. Um, I believe from some of our uh, correspondence that the volume on the minister's message may not have been uh, particularly loud, um, we will try and uh, put, the, uh, put that, that message uh, on our social media channels and also on our website.
um, for people to view at a later point. So we now come to our opportunity for the media to pose questions to our panel and to ask questions about the report. Um, as mentioned uh, before, please do post your questions uh, as media in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. And please do start by indicating which media outlet you represent. So turning to our first question, which is from Seth Borenstein from the Associated Press, um, which was asked initially specifically for uh, one of our panelists, um, but the panelist that perhaps is best able to answer this question, uh, I'll indicate in a moment. The question is, if some of the climate solutions that aren't biodiversity friendly are adopted, how bad can it be for biodiversity? Um, I'm going to ask Professor Elmut Arneth to answer that question. Again, one more time, uh, Elmut, if some of the climate solutions that are not biodiversity friendly are adopted, how bad can it be for biodiversity? The floor is yours, Elmut. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for the question. And uh, let me maybe stick to one example that was already mentioned in the few slides that Hans was presenting just before. So if we uh, continue to emit fossil CO2 as we're doing at the moment, we might actually in future have to rely on very large amounts of bioenergy crops being planted together with carbon capture and storage to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at large scale. And some of the scenarios uh, we can envisage potentially speaks of millions of hectares of bioenergy crops. We're sort of talking sometimes of land areas that would be equivalent to two times the entire land area of the Indian subcontinent. On the other hand, we are already now using much more than 50% of the land for our food and, and timber production. Um, so as you can imagine, planting those additional large bioenergy crop areas will put enormous pressure on existing natural lands to destroy them, which would be fairly catastrophic for biodiversity. But actually, there would possibly also be quite detrimental effects for food security as well. So that is sort of one example that really demonstrates that we really should better decarbonize our societies and reduce emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer, Almut. Much appreciated. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask again, please do not post questions in the chat box. We won't be able to get them. Please post them in the Q&A box. Uh, our next question is from Zoya Teerstein from Grist, who asks, is this finding that climate policies can have negative impacts on biodiversity, um, but policies to encourage biodiversity are beneficial or neutral in combating climate change? Is that new? So I'm going to ask Professor Paul Ledley uh, if he can take that question. One more time, Paul. Zoya asks, is the finding that climate policies can have negative impacts on biodiversity? but policies to encourage biodiversity are beneficial or neutral in combating climate change. Is that new? Over to you, Paul. So I think the answer to that is none of the individual pieces are new. And actually that our job is to synthesize the information that's already available uh, out in the scientific literature. What's new is to bring this all together in one coherent package so that people can understand that double message. Um, and the second thing is that a lot of this understanding is evol uh, evolving fairly, fairly rapidly. And so we've tried to put this in a, in a way that um, both the public and, and uh, decision makers can understand the current thinking about the relationships between biodiversity uh, and, and uh, climate change. Um, and I think the, the last point is a really important point, and that is that uh, although some of the uh, impacts of climate change mitigation on biodiversity have been relatively well studied in the, uh, and discussed in the, in the literature. There are lots of different things that are being done for climate change, especially around adaptation. And many of those things can also potentially be a bit negative for biodiversity. And there's a real risk that biodiversity is going to be lost, uh, die from a thousand cuts. And we really had to put the, uh, that up front as a message that there's just lots of things that are going on out there in terms of climate change, many of which could be good for biodiversity, but many of which also could be bad for biodiversity. 
So the real important point of this, uh, this uh, report is to bring all of that information together uh, so that there's a, a, a coherent understanding of those interactions. And that's new. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Much appreciated. Our next question is a question for Hans, um, and it comes from Tetsuji Ida from Kyoto News. Tetsuji asks Hans, now we are witnessing a vicious cycle of climate change and biodiversity loss. How can we reverse the direction of this wheel and achieve transformative change in a limited amount of time? In other words, who can be the game changer? What is the leverage to make transformative change against this inertia? So Hans, question to you. Would you like me to repeat it or is it, is it clear? I, I think it is rather clear. Thanks a lot, uh, Rob. And that's certainly uh, a, core, a core question to be addressed. Uh, the special report on 1.5 uh, by the IPCC has, has identified that actually policy will end uh, in, its, in the background. Societal will is key uh, and is a key bottleneck in, in terms of implementing these uh, solutions. We have emphasized in, in this uh, report that cutting emissions and, and bringing them down in line with scenarios uh, for the uh, keeping to the Paris climate uh, limits is a key pre precondition for everything um, to, to follow and be developed in, in parallel as well. And the biodiversity strength, the strengthening of biodiversity and ecosystems to recover from the human uh, challenges and, and be ready to help uh, climate uh, mitigation is, I, th I think, another parallel uh, string of action that needs to be um, implemented. So policy turning around and, and being convinced and, and taking ambitious um, action, uh, not compromising on what we know from from science, I think, is a is a key uh, co a key precondition uh, for for this to take up up speed. And uh, as the G seven is currently um, unfolding, um, and um, uh, leaders are discussing, I think they should make that a topic of their discussions. Thank you very much, Hans. We turn now to a question from Khaled Suleiman from Daraj Media. The Middle East and North Africa region um, is the most affected area by drought and climate change. Uh, I would like to know if recent reports cover biodiversity loss in this region due to climate change, and what is the scientific perspective to reduce the estimated impacts on human life? I wonder if I could ask Professor Guy Midgley to field this question for us. Guy, do you need me to repeat the question? No, I've got it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Thank you. thanks for the question. Um, maybe first I can say that uh, we didn't in this report do a comprehensive analyses at uh, regional levels. And uh, the better place to look for that sort of information would be the upcoming IPCC six assessment report. But what I can say is that um, it looks as though a lot of the really adverse effects on human populations in that part of the world occur through the groundwater system. And there is quite a lot of work uh, on impacts of climate change on the groundwater system and interactions with human use of the groundwater system. So that uh, I, I, I would suggest is one of the most important interactions to, to be looking for there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. Appreciate the answer. Our next question comes from Susanna Elliding from Tagesspiegel, who asks, um, and I'm going to ask this question to Professor Unai Pascual, could the speakers please elaborate on the relationship between climate change and biodiversity loss on the one side and justice and equality on the other side? Unai, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks for the question. So basically the report highlights uh, the idea of uh, equity and justice as one of the uh, levers to, to be able to manage um, uh, the joint climate and biodiversity crisis for various reasons. One is that we know, and there's plenty of evidence, that uh, relatively speaking, uh, the main impacts 
uh, own people uh, will be borne by the most vulnerable societies, uh, usually marginalized societies. And here we can include uh, uh, different communities, uh, one of them being indigenous people around the world, especially those who have been stewards of, of nature. But there are all other angles to understanding the connection between equity and the climate and biodiversity crisis. Uh, one of them being that um, it is very important for different voices, uh, different values to be heard and respected, uh, to try to put together uh, successful options and solutions, uh, which uh, will be in some way context specific, uh, because uh, there's no magical solutions that will work everywhere in the world. So respecting and, and bringing to the table uh, those different voices is something that uh, is at the core of, of uh, the idea of equity and social equity and justice. So I think <clears throat> uh, those would be two main main points. Perhaps the last one is just to, to realize, and I think uh, the report highlights this in various places, that any policy intervention uh, to try to solve the crisis, this coupled environmental crisis will have winners and losers. So even in the solution space, uh, there will be situations where uh, those who will lose out from certain interventions will need to be compensated from those who will reap the benefits. Uh, and this is another, another part of the, of the idea of the distribution of the benefits and burdens that might arise from, from any type of intervention. Thank you very much, Unai. Appreciate the answer. Our next question comes from Reuters, and I'm going to pose this question to Professor Pamela Makovi. Um, Pam, this is from Kanupriya Kapoor from Reuters, who asks, the synopsis and the speakers mentioned some conservation efforts, which so far have been insufficient. What do you think contributed to biodiversity being left behind, so to say, from the global agenda, and what needs to be done to change this? Pam, the floor is yours. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think to some degree, part of the answer is what our other speakers have emphasized, which is for far too long, we've tended to see climate and biodiversity as separate issues. And so our policy responses have often been very siloed. It's very common, for example, for ministries of environment to deal with climate and then ministries of agriculture or natural resources to deal with biodiversity. So that institutional siloing um, has often meant that we treat these separately and climate has simply gotten more attention. Part of the reason I think climate has gotten more attention is that people are increasingly feeling it in their own lives, whether it's wildfires in Australia, whether it is increasing hurricane risks in the Pacific. And so that sort of visibility of climate impacts um, in people's lives, I think has really heightened awareness of climate change. And our report points out though, is that biodiversity has that similar effect on human well-being. If we lose mangroves in coastal areas, that has a knock-on effect to human welfare. It might result in a decline of fisheries that people depend on. It might increase flood risks for homeowners who live in coastal areas who might not have the protection of nature if that nature has been uh, degraded. And so really making sure that people understand those connections to human well-being, to helping us eliminate poverty, all of these are related to both biodiversity and to climate. And I think as that realization increases, we will see increasing attention to that need to include biodiversity in our climate solutions. Thank you very much, Pam. Our next question is going to be posed to Professor Pete Smith. Pete, this is a question from Marta Enrique from, from the BBC, who asks, which solutions or interventions do you see as the most promising for both biodiversity and climate? Pete, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, luckily, there are a number of interventions that we can make that are beneficial for both climate change and biodiversity. Those mostly rely on protecting our existing high carbon ecosystems because we want to keep that carbon in those ecosystems. So I'm thinking of peatlands and forests in particular. So protecting those areas, those pristine environments will be one thing that we could do that's good for both the climate and biodiversity. And also 
also restoring degraded ecosystems. So peatland restoration is a great example. Degraded peatlands can be emitting um, tens of tons of CO2 per hectare per year, many more times than a, than a, than a, a, a family car uh, emits in a year. So by restoring those ecosystems uh, to their former glory, we can both uh, uh, benefit the climate and we can protect biodiversity. And we've also got options on our managed land to um, uh, manage them in a more sustainable and biodiversity friendly way. So there's, there are options in many spaces where we can do this well. And there's really the way that we implement and we just have to be mindful of both the climate and biodiversity together when we implement them so that we don't get perverse uh, solutions. Great, thank you very much, Pete. We now have a follow-up question from Seth uh, Borenstein at AP, and I'm gonna pose this follow-up to uh, Professor Dr. Yun Shin. Yun, the question is in chart number eight, what specific biodiversity solutions can worsen climate change? Um, and I assume you'll know what chart number eight is. Over to you. Yes, thank you for this question. Well, one of the main results of the report is that from the biodiversity side of things, the bulk of the biodiversity measures are positive or um, contributing to climate change regulation, climate change mitigation and adaptation. That is something which is very important. And also one second thing that uh, should be raised here is that one must realize that Climate change and biodiversity loss share common root causes. Human population growth, our modes of production and consumption, our governance systems, our economies, technology development, and our value system. So there's a huge opportunity here by mobilizing our energy and finances, our individual choices, by transforming our systems. We can kill two birds with one stone. So we can be efficient with high benefits to cost outcomes. So having said that, there are specific um, nature-based solutions that uh, P. Smith evoked earlier. So we can, uh, there are a number of actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems. And this include reducing deforestation and degradation forests, uh, mangroves, don't forget the coastal marine vegetated habitats. Mangroves, hugely important contributors to climate regulation. They can sequester four times more carbon than tropical forests per area, per unit area. So that being said, what is true is that nature-based solutions, even though they contribute largely to climate change mitigation, they can't be, uh, they can't do everything. Nature can't solve all the climate change uh, issues. So it must be clearly accompanied by clear cuts in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much, Yun. Our next question is from Zafria Rinat from Haaretz newspaper in Israel. Um, I'm going to pose this question uh, back to um, Professor Paul Ledley. Paul, the question is, can we predict approximately when ecological thresholds will be crossed at regional scales and prepare actions to mitigate or reverse climate effects in a timely way? Paul. So uh, the answer is yes and no. So for some of key tipping points, uh, so for example, um, the bleaching of coral reefs uh, which is we're beginning to see at, at very large scales uh, right now, or the degradation of permafrost in Arctic tundra, which we're also seeing happen already due to, to climate change. Those are tipping points uh, where we know fairly well what's causing them. And uh, we've been pretty good at predicting that they would occur and that had occurred. And we think we know that uh, essentially where some of the key tipping points are. But I think an important message about tipping points uh, is that uh, we don't know when most tipping points will occur at regional scales. And that's for two reasons. One is that uh, at regional scales, uh, climate's very difficult to, to predict uh, into the future, especially uh, pre pre precipitation patterns. And the second thing is that we don't know how ecosystems react in, in many cases, especially in interactions with, with, uh, with people. And so some tipping points, yes, many tipping points we really don't know. And so that's why we shouldn't even get close to where they might tip. Thank you very much, Paul.
Uh, another question this time for, uh, for Professor Almut Arneth again from Marina Eisen from Amphibia magazine in Argentina. Um, Marina asks, should governments rethink their agricultural policies in light of this report? Almut. Mm. Yeah, that's an important aspect. And uh, let's keep in mind, for instance, that round about roughly three quarters of total greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalents are actually related to agricultural systems. So obviously we can do a lot here in reducing emissions as we're talking about, and also agriculture, intensive agriculture in particular is of course a major driver of biodiversity loss. So there are actually many agricultural measures sort of, you know, under the umbrella of sustainable agriculture that um, could be implemented and that would actually target both in improving biodiversity as well as uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions that could range from agricultural practices that are restoring degraded agricultural soils and building up much more carbon in our agricultural soil, therefore storing CO2 from the atmosphere as well as improving uh, fertility of soils. It could also be agricultural policies that in the end lead to less use of pesticides which are detrimental to, bio, uh, to biodiversity. This is just a couple of examples, but yes, agricultural policies are probably one of the very, very important levers governments do actually have in order to really create win-win, both from a climate change perspective and from a biodiversity perspective. Thank you very much, Almut. The question now for Anne Laragadri, the Executive Secretary of IPUS. Um, this is from Miren from Liberation in France. And it's a question about the goal of the organizations in, in terms of publishing this report, whether the goal is to educate and inform the population, uh, or is it in some way to place pressure on decision makers, um, perhaps also in private companies and in government? And then a second part of this question, and will there be follow-up presentations and workshops um, with governments and decision makers following this report? And the floor is yours. Thank you. So. Um... In, in, in general terms, uh, the, the purpose of uh, IBIS and of IPCC is to really strengthen the science policy interface, uh, which means to provide uh, the status of knowledge regarding biodiversity and climate change to inform a diversity uh, of actors. Of course, we uh, respond to requests from uh, governments first and foremost, but our reports are also targeted at uh, a diversity of uh, actors such as aside from governments, well, within governments, uh, we try to target options for actions uh, within different sectors of, gov of governments, but we also uh, speak to uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, there are also actions targeted at uh, cities or communities, indigenous peoples and local communities are, are very uh, important, particularly uh, for the work uh, of uh, IBES. So there is really a, a, a major emphasis on uh, providing uh, scientific information in a way that is palatable to a large diversity of uh, actors, since, uh, as uh, Unai mentioned, the actions are going to have to be declined uh, at many different levels and involve uh, many different types of uh, people uh, on the ground. Thank you, Anne. Before you go, I'm going to actually do a, a, another quick question to you, because I believe I may have made a, a bit of an error. I think the question from um, Zafria Renat from Haaretz newspaper in Israel was actually this one. Do you feel that biodiversity conservation is not getting enough attention because of the current uh, public and scientific focus on climate change? Anne? Well, perhaps what we want to emphasize here is uh, how relevant uh, biodiversity conservation is for uh, climate change uh, mitigation. So uh, biodiversity convention has been uh, receiving a little bit of uh, interest, but not enough, particularly in the context of addressing uh, many other types of uh, very uh, current issues. I'm thinking uh, about the emergence of uh, diseases, for example, and pandemics. We've seen uh, the uh, role of better understanding the origin of diseases, and this is a typically a, a biodiversity issue. And now also within the context of climate change, uh, there is more emphasis uh, that is uh, necessary to protect uh, 
uh, ecosystems and to restore them in order to really make nature a work for us in solving some of our most uh, acute uh, issues. Thank you very much, Anne. A question now from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, this is from Herton Escobar, and I'm going to ask Dr. David Obura to answer this question. David, how do you see the current trends of tropical forest loss around the world, and particularly the Brazilian Amazon, considering its effects on both biodiversity and climate? And then a second question, considering the somewhat disappointing results of the Aichi biodiversity targets, how do you expect this report can motivate policymakers to take decisive action now, especially as regards creating protected areas um, on land and in the ocean? David. Thank you, Rob. Um, so for the first part of the question, I'll just answer that briefly as I'm a marine biologist. It's not my main uh, expertise, but from the IPBES global assessment in 2019, I mean, it was a fairly clear that um, continued loss in tropical forest area is an ongoing problem um, and does need to be addressed for both biodiversity and climate solutions. And I think our report does go into many of these aspects. Um, so, but I don't have the particular regional knowledge. But on the second question um, around the HE biodiversity targets, we hope that this report, and as many of the other panelists have already pointed out, is that the HE targets were probably held back because we looked at biodiversity, or the world looked at biodiversity and climate as different issues, as well as from food security and other global challenges. Whereas now there's a much greater appreciation that they're very linked, and that's that's a major thrust of our report. So with the two conferences of parties for biodiversity and climate happening very close together, we hope that the um, the the recommendations that we make, particularly around nature-based solutions that are good for climate, good for biodiversity, and good for people, so have multifunctional benefits, um, will help a lot. And lastly, that the creation of protected areas is one of the solutions uh, to resolving the biodiversity crisis, but not the only ones. And there's a lot of actions that can be taken with conserved areas and natural habitats and restoration in uh, landscapes where people are living and working as well that are not um, you know, pristine uh, intact areas. There's a lot of actions that can be taken across the landscapes and seascapes to address uh, both biodiversity and climate together. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of questions coming in from our media colleagues. Um, we're going to try and get through as many of them as we can. The next question I'm going to pose will be to Professor Wolfgang Kiesling. It's a question from Graham Lawton of New Scientist in London. Um, Wolfgang, the question is, the UN has identified a third planetary crisis alongside climate and biodiversity waste and pollution. Is this justified? Can we solve that problem too alongside climate and nature loss? Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, this is actually part of the uh, big problem of biodiversity. Um, pollution and waste is part of um, habitat destruction, and this is extremely harmful to biodiversity. Right now, um, habitat destruction, including pollution, is the main reason actually for biodiversity crisis. Climate change is playing in on top of this. So um, if you will, this third um, planetary crisis is currently the crisis for biodiversity and climate change will then make it even worse. And that's all I have to say on that. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, we have a question which I'm going to pose to Professor Almut Arnath again. Uh, Almut, the question is from Mayumi Nobuta um, from Main Chi newspapers in Japan. The question is, there are motions in place to relax the standards of environmental assessments in order to expedite the introduction of renewable energies. How can a balance be created between introducing renewables quickly and protecting biodiversity? Almut. Yeah, that's an important one. Maybe just to briefly provide some background where I think that question comes from is um, that uh, quite a bit of renewable energy, um, you know, related to e-mobility, solar panels, wind panels, and so forth, relies on mining for resources, both on land and at sea. Um, and these mines are, of course, very destructive to ecosystems, and particularly 
uh, with the deep sea floor mining, which sort of, you know, seems to be starting at the moment, there's great concern about the destruction of ecosystems that we actually don't really know yet. So there's obviously a, a critical issue. On the other hand, renewable energies are, of course, the key aspect to get us out of part of the climate change mess. So we really need to make sure that we're developing renewable energies in a sustainable way. And that does include um, having sort of mining activities with the appropriate environmental measures in place, but also very importantly, uh, being societally acceptable and acceptable to people who are living in mining areas. So this is a very critical aspect to keep in mind. Thank you, Almut. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had scheduled this launch to end on the hour, but since there are so many media questions remaining, I'm going to extend our session by 15 further minutes. If you do need to leave, thank you very much for joining us, but in order to try and give uh, as many of our media colleagues as possible the opportunity for their questions, I am going to extend this. Um, I'm going to pose another question to Dr. David Obura. This is a question from Sonia Sanchez at ARA newspaper in Barcelona. Um, David, the question is that the next biodiversity summit, which is COP15 in China, um, intends to reach a global agreement to ensure 30% protected areas globally. According to the report, this is the minimum needed. If this is eventually achieved, would you say it's a success for the international community? Um, but I guess we would need a proper scientific plan to define the specific areas needed to be protected? Question mark. How should it be implemented? David. Yes, thank you, Rob. Yes, this is a very topical um, question. And the target around 30% of protected areas around the globe is arising for COP15 of the Biodiversity Biodiversity Summit. There is a lot of scientific literature advocating for this, and we certainly know that uh, biodiversity is in decline and we're exceeding our, our footprint in terms of its use uh, and impact on it. So we need to have much higher levels of protection than we have right now in sustainability. Um, a big issue with the target is that the protected areas need to be effectively managed. Uh, and there are many areas that are effectively managed for biodiversity and conservation that are not inside protected areas. So these can also contribute to this proportion. And there's a lot of work at the moment under the label of other effective conservation measures to identify what the criteria are and make sure that we're incorporating those. There's also a lot of area that is under the authority of indigenous peoples and local communities uh, that also doesn't fall under the protected category, but is intact and has, and has had people interacting with it and using it for centuries and millennia in some cases. And so working out how to address the ethical and the, um, the governance issues of uh, protection and conservation is a critical part of achieving this, this target. But we do need to achieve, and it will be a success if we can achieve it by the end of this 10-year uh, period. Thank you, David. Question now from Stephen Leahy from the Weather Network, which I'm going to pose to uh, Dr. Pamela McElvey, from Professor Pamela McElvey, sorry. Um, Pam, the question is, what role should the private sector play? Yeah, our report points out that to tackle these dual crises, we really need all hands on deck. So that's not just governments, but it's lots of different actors. So as David just mentioned, for example, indigenous peoples play an incredibly important role in biodiversity conservation. Similarly, the private sector has a really important role to play as well. We know that the private sector, for example, agribusiness, um, energy development and so forth um, may have a disproportionate impact on both biodiversity and climate. So we need to work with the private sector to find solutions. There's a lot going on in this field right now. Uh, for example, under climate, we have uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related um, Financial Disclosures. We now have a nature-related task force. And the, the goal of these two task forces is to get the private sector to think about how loss of biodiversity or increasing temperatures under climate change actually creates risk for private sector businesses and build that risk into their decision-making. And that can be a really powerful tool to nudge and move the private sector um, to make actions that are more beneficial for biodiversity and climate. Um, and so it's those sorts of moves that the private sector can play a really important role on. Thanks very much, Pam. Question now from Thomas Krumenacker from Riff Reporter in Germany. 
um, which I'm going to pose to uh, Professor Paul Ledley. Paul, the report strongly suggests and supports the concept of nature-based solutions. Do you expect the results will already advance corresponding initiatives at the upcoming COPs 15 and 26? Well, we certainly hope it does. Um, so uh, clearly nature-based solutions already are part of the discussions for the global biodiversity framework. And they're also part of the discussions uh, around uh, the climate convention. Um, what we hope it will also do is to make sure that the, the discussion around nature is taking down that some of the things that are being sold as nature-based solutions are don't meet some of the requirements of what we call nature-based solutions. And that is that they're not necessarily good for biodiversity uh, or for, for people. So uh, we also hope that our report will clearly highlight those things that truly are nature-based solutions, which mean they're good for nature, they help solve the climate crisis, and they're also good for people. Thanks a lot, Paul. Question again for Professor Pam McElvey, this time from Sharon from Risk Magazine. Sharon asks, how should biodiversity considerations be integrated into financial sector regulations? Example, company accounting and markets and banking regulation. How advanced is IPBES and its partners with the official sector for financial regulation? Pam. Yeah, building off my previous answer, this is a really important and emerging field, thinking about the risk to the private sector, the risk to financial markets um, from potential biodiversity collapse. You can imagine um, an agribusiness that somehow experienced the loss of pollinators that would have a financial impact on their bottom line. And so there's a real need to ensure that both financial markets and private sector businesses and governments, and particularly um, uh, lending that's associated with governments, um, all are potentially taking into account biodiversity and the decisions that they're making. Um, IPES is actually going to be playing an increasingly important role in this. Um, because there is going to be a new methodological assessment coming out in the next couple of years that looks at the different methodological ways that we can account for nature, um, ways in which financial markets could, uh, for example, price nature better. Um, and that report on business and biodiversity is just starting, that'll be coming out. And it'll provide a lot of clarity, I think, to private sector businesses and the financial markets because it's a bit of the Wild West right now. No one's really sure exactly how to build nature into some of their financial models and their risk models. And so IBES is going to hopefully be able to provide a great sort of lay of the land and an assessment of which tools are strongest, which ones work the best. Um, as I said, there's a lot going on right here. IBES is gonna try to provide some clarity. We also have the new UN system of, of uh, ecological accounting, which is helping countries build in natural capital into their financial accounts. So there's a lot of exciting work going on right here and, and it's gonna be a field that we need to keep our eye on going forward. Thanks very much. I think that's a, a question Pam gets excited about. We now move to uh, a question to Dr. Yun Shin. Yun, a question from uh, Michel de Moulinier from Les Soir in Bel Brussels. Your report warns against, quote, some renewable energies generating surges of mining activity, end quote. Is this not the case with the majority of renewable energies? And could you perhaps elaborate a bit on that, please? Well, Yes, it's the case of most renewable energy, but I would say it's the case of most industrial products requiring minerals and metals. So it's true that there's, there's a lot of mining sourcing those renewable energies installations, uh, wind turbines and solar panels. And this has might, might have some consequences on new um, uh, mineral um, dep uh, deposits, you say that in English, uh, at the sea bottom, and and this uh, has may have some negative environmental impacts. So we can't say that it is sustainable exploitation because it's not a renewable uh, energy source or mineral energy source, but we can uh, put some environmental limits to that impact. Also in the deep sea, uh, in deep sea ecosystem, we uh, need to know much more about the ecosystems in place and all the species living there are, are generally long-lived. 
with a low um, capacity to renew the biomass, but also these are very specific species which are adapted to very extreme conditions. And so we need to know more about that. But yes, it is not the panacea of, it is not the privilege of some renewable energy uh, solutions. So yeah, that's all I can say for now. Thank you, Yun. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we probably have time for about three or four more questions, and then I'm going to afraid I have to wrap things up. Um, next question, this time to uh, Professor Unai Pasquale from Tetsuji Ida. It's a uh, question that's a follow-up from Kyoto News. What's the most important or effective policy to put nature-based solutions into the mainstream of decision-making? Is it economic measures like taxation? Uh, is it approach like the task force on nature-related financial disclosures? Unai, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thanks for the question. Well, uh, <clears throat> this question could be answered in different ways, but clearly uh, the question touches on something which is uh, really important, which is uh, economic incentives. At the moment, it's very clear that uh, some major economic incentives are geared gear towards uh, the opposite direction towards the one we should be going to solve the climate and biodiversity crisis. I'm thinking about, and this is highlighted in the report, about perverse subsidies that encourage the overexploitation of uh, natural resources or uh, perverse subsidies that encourage the use of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, if we were able to address this issue uh, and relocate or uh, reallocate uh, some of that funding in the short term towards investing in nature-based solutions, we would have achieved uh, uh, a big deal in the short term. So that's a, a social kind of tipping intervention uh, that uh, could be put in place to fix what otherwise is known as institutional failures, uh, economic institutional failures. Uh, it's not just about market failures, it's also about the way institutions operate and the ways uh, both financial and other types of institutions are promoting certain uh, productive activities uh, and so on. So I think, yes, uh, uh, nature-based solutions could be scaled up and, and put in place in many parts of the world in the short term. But uh, in order to do that, we also need to address uh, those uh, institutional failures in the first place. Thank you very much, Unai. A question from Elise Tempelhoff from South Africa. Um, and I'm going to pose this question to Anne, if I may. Anne, the question is, um, are these findings being communicated to politicians and business and industry leaders? And how will you track their progress? Or does this report serve as a warning to them? Um, Anne, could I ask you to take the floor? Yes, thank you very much. So. Uh... We do not really warn uh, anyone, but our uh, reports, this one, but all of our other reports are, are there to inform uh, people uh, so that they then determine for themselves what is their best uh, course uh, of action. And so that applies to uh, politicians, that also uh, applies to uh, industry leaders. Now, in terms of tracking uh, progress, um, the IBES Global Assessment uh, was uh, tasked with reviewing uh, uh, the progress against the IG targets of the Convention on Biological Diversity. So IBES has played uh, this role to review some of the uh, globally uh, uh, agreed uh, goals. And uh, that may again be the case, possibly uh, moving forward uh, in the context of the new uh, post-2020 global biodiversity uh, assessment, uh, but that uh, remains uh, to be seen. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Elise, I'm going to add one little comment from my own to that, which is that IPUS does a form of impact tracking. Um, if you Google IPUS impact tracking, you will find that on our website. It's not comprehensive. It is indicative, but the IPUS impact tracking database is one way that we're trying to do that. Um, second to last question, this time I'm going to pose this to Professor Pete Smith. Pete, this is from Pierre Porn from the Bangkok Tribune. What kind of policies are urgently needed amongst policymakers to address the interplay or interconnections of climate change and biodiversity? Do you think it's still possible in time? 
Uh, yes. So um, a number of nature based solutions are being implemented or are proposed to be implemented by an, a number of countries for their nationally determined contributions. And it's just a matter of making sure that they co deliver to climate change mitigation and adaptation and to biodiversity. Take, for example, uh, planting a monoculture of um, non native uh, uh, trees um, that can be very bad for biodiversity but planting native trees in a mixed woodland can be very good for biodiversity. So it's not a matter of what you do, it's a matter of how it's implemented. So just making sure that there's good talking between those, those departments that look after biodiversity and cons conservation and those that set the climate change, change targets is really the thing to do because these solutions are out there and we have to make sure they co-deliver. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, I'm going to reverse my previous decision and have two more questions. This is the second to last question, and I'm going to pose it to Professor Paul Ledley. This is a question from Adriel uh, Magneti, which is, um, what are the contributions to the discussion on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework? Paul. So some of this has already been addressed already. David Obiro has discussed uh, some of this. Um, one of the things that, um, we talk about in the report is the importance of taking climate change into account when we're setting uh, uh, setting up conservation. And that's something that we haven't discussed uh, yet. And that is that we have to really rethink uh, conservation. And that's because species and ecosystems are going to move around a lot as climate warms. Um, and that's going to, in some cases, make places where we've put protected areas uh, no longer uh, efficient in, in, in protecting the biodiversity that they were intended to. Currently, that discussion has not been uh, delved into in, in the global biodiversity framework. Um, and that's clearly one of the things that uh, would be very good for it, it to take into account. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, some of what is, is in our report is just going to reinforce those things that are in the global biodiversity framework. And that is the global biodiversity framework puts a big emphasis on um, uh, nature based solutions as contributing to climate change mitigation. It also has very strong uh, ecosystem restoration goals and ecosystem protection goals. And what we're hoping our report will do, as has already been said, it will reinforce the idea that those targets that are being set up in the global biodiversity framework are not just good for uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, but they're also good for the Sustainable Development Goals. They're also good uh, for the Climate Change Convention and for people in general. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, our final question is one from Roland Tate. I'm going to ask this question to Hans. Um, Hans, the question is, uh, what is the likely impact of this report or how will this report uh, impact the processes for COP26 and COP15 of uh, the UNFCCC and of the CBD? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Rob, for, for this, uh, this question. Um, I, I think what it, what it will do is certainly it will connect the two COPs in, in terms of uh, the thinking and uh, we in the IPCC will take um, this report on on board for preparing our sixth assessment report and uh, the connection between climate and and biodiversity uh, will be strengthened at both COPs that is my expectation and there may be spin-offs from the biodiversity COP to to the to the climate uh, COP in, in, in Glasgow. Um, there are already many organizations in, in the green zone in, involved at uh, the climate COPs in, in terms of discussing the connections between climate change and biodiversity, largely from the point of view of impacts, but increasingly also from the point of view of nature-based um, uh, solutions, bringing the human um, and the societal aspects into the picture and developing a more holistic approach, how to, yeah, essentially say saving uh, the planet for for all of us um, will will be um, the the next step, I guess. So having a holistic approach, going away from the silo approach, just looking at climate or biodiversity, I think will be a consequence. Thank you so much, Hans.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the question and answer session for media. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our media. Before we end, a couple of words about media interviews. If you would like to schedule a follow-up interview, please send us an email to media at ipbest.net. With that, thank you again to everyone. Please do remember to post about the report and this launch on social media using the hashtag, hashtag biodiversity climate science. This brings us to the end of our virtual media launch. Thank you again, everybody. Please uh, stay healthy and a final goodbye from all of us. Thank you. <laughs>